atheists have strange ideas, apparently, because to some theists, atheism is more than just not believing in gods. And a channel that has been covered a few times on this channel is getting sceptic... No, hang on. No, no, I'm going on holiday or vacation, so I'm calling in reinforcements. Hello, I'm the Skeptic, the British floating circle that watches people make extraordinary claims and then I explain why I don't accept what they're saying. Some fairly well-known theists on the YouTube still have no idea what atheism is and misrepresent it. And one channel that I've covered a few times is back with some fallacious arguments that need to be pointed out. And so, since it's the time of year that I take a week's vacation, I've asked JL from Bridge the Divide to step in for me. Thank goodness someone more handsome and much smarter than I could ever be can step in and bring up the intelligence of my videos. But before we find out what atheists' ideas are, if this isn't your first sceptic video, hit the like, the subscribe and the bell to get more videos like this in your feed. And a super thanks to those that hit super thanks in some recent videos. Condor Boss, Yuji Fanic and Unfriendly Atheist. Lisa the Rainbow Giraffe bestows leaves upon you. More hen. Right, take it away, JL. I'm going on vacay. Thanks so much, Skeptic. Now you go ahead, sit back, put whatever your equivalent of feet are up, and take a load off. I'll take it from here. Welcome, everybody. I am JL from the channel Bridge the Divide, where I examine irrational beliefs, the irrational behaviors that often follow, and how we, with education, rationality, and reason, can bridge the societal divides that they create. Today, we're going to take a look at a video from a content creator that I have really been looking forward to covering. And that individual is none other than Franciscan Fry and Catholic priest Casey Cole from over on his channel, Breaking in the Habit. Say my name. Whoa, whoa, easy there, Walt. Casey's only here to break bad with a different kind of drug. It's called personal validation, and it really gets the dopamine flowing. First hits free, but then it's 10% a week for the rest of your life. Now, in this video, Casey is purportedly debunking five atheist ideas. And I know, that is a really weird title for a video. Seeing as how atheism is literally just not believing in the existence of a god or gods, and being an atheist it doesn't logically entail holding to any particular scientific or philosophical positions. So unless Casey's got that direct evidence of the existence of his god that would result in all atheists logically becoming theists, I have no clue what ideas he thinks are logically entailed by being an atheist or even how he plans to attack atheism by debunking them. That being said, let's dive right in and see exactly what this Friar Tuck cosplay champion has in store for us. If you've been a Christian longer than a minute, you are probably painfully aware of the fact that faith in much of the Western world is in a downward trend. While individuals who have been severely indoctrinated by their particular cults or sects may have a great deal of difficulty understanding why exactly this is a positive trend for modern society, I've never felt it really necessary for non-believers to revel in the slow demise of any culture. Even if that demise was ultimately brought about by the unsustainable divisive and exclusionary nature of the culture itself. It's important to remember that many of the individuals that count themselves among these diminishing groups are in fact victims themselves. And when their support systems inevitably collapse, they, like all humans eventually do, will require some form of positive support system to turn to. And I for one think that non-believers can compassionately provide that support system for them just as we have consistently done for one another. Over the past decade, study after study has revealed a sharp decline in religious affiliation, church attendance, and belief in God, while the number of people identifying as having no religion has grown rapidly. Rapidly. Honestly, I never really understood how faith groups missed this inevitable trend. My God. It's been right in front of us the whole time. A cursory glance at human history reveals all of the evidence one needs to see that religions, like all other social constructs such as race, money, languages, cultures, governments, and even countries themselves, are as subject to positive and negative selection pressures as everything else. Analogous to biology in which the driving force of change is genetics, the driving force of change in social constructs is information. Using this analogy, we can see that religions are born, they grow, they mutate, they evolve, they sometimes become symbiotic or even parasitic with other religions or ideologies, and sometimes they're even consumed by them, leading to their inevitable relegation to history. And as much as the light speed transmission of information has helped, it's been the overall behaviors of the faithful, both historical and contemporary, as well as their particularly divisive positions on a number of social, political, and legislative issues, that have acted as a sort of artificial selection pressure, selecting negatively against the future existence of faith groups. And the only logical 
logical reason that I can think of that would explain why they missed something so obvious is that their slavish desperation to maintaining their numerical power by controlling what information their adherents had access to ultimately left them defenseless against the one thing they could never hope to control, the inexorable march of time itself. Why is this the case? Well, it's complicated. Not a mystery, but it's complicated. While there are a lot of complicated factors here, yes, when you look at the bigger picture, the explanation is revealed to be far more simple. You did it to yourselves. Some of the problem is definitely with Christians ourselves. Well, they say the first step to solving any problem is being able to admit that you have one. If you're interested in an introspective look at what we're doing to drive people away, check out part two of this series here. Otherwise, what I'd like to look at in this video are the outside forces causing people to become atheist. And this is where I see your first big mistake, Casey. And honestly, it's kind of a shame because you were off to such an intellectually honest start. As I mentioned earlier, there are two forces at work here. Widespread access to information at the speed of light and the collective behaviors of the faithful. Now, while I commend you for acknowledging the direct role that the faithful have played in the weakening of their faith stranglehold on society, you've already come out of the gate with a mischaracterization of the information side of this issue. Are the outside forces causing people to become atheist? When you refer to the information aspect of this as outside forces, you immediately frame the spread of information as something that is deliberately working against the efforts of the faith. You automatically conjure images of opposition, conflict, and battle. In other words, you plant the idea of an enemy in the minds of believers that doesn't actually exist. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand implicitly why you said it this way. As this video of yours is specifically aimed at a steadily diminishing number of believers, it behooves you to actively diminish that which you have misrepresented as a direct threat to both them and the faith in order to assuage their concerns. I get it, you do what you think you have to do, but in doing so, you've gone and missed or or flatly ignored the fact that it is behaviors just like that, that pathological need to control the flow of information by any means necessary, that got your faith into this position in the first place. And the fact that instead of copying to and reconciling the logical possibility that you've been wrong this entire time, and your entire position is based entirely upon your personal feelings of dissatisfaction and your fears of the unknown, as opposed to the demonstrable facts of reality, you would rather sit there and manipulate the information that your followers have access to in order to save your own ass demonstrates to everyone that in spite of all the world's information sitting right there at your fingertips, you haven't actually learned a damn thing. You've got blinders on to the world. Here are the five biggest threats to faith and what we can do to respond to each. Number one, scientific materialism. What has that got to do with it? Back off, man. I'm a scientist. So before I let Casey run down this somewhat complicated topic, I want to make sure that all of you out there have the best information possible to reference in response to whatever he throws at you. First off, materialism itself is the philosophical position that matter, that which occupies space-time, possesses mass, and is distinct from energy, is itself the fundamental substance of nature, and that everything, including consciousness, is the result of material interactions. Secondly, as for the term scientific materialism, it's really not all that different from basic materialism, though it does expand to the idea that things relegated to the realm of the supernatural should be rejected, because, by definition, if there was evidence for them, then they wouldn't be categorized as supernatural anymore. The philosophical stance of scientific materialism is attributed to Spanish-American philosopher George Santayana, whose aphorisms like, only the dead have seen the end of war, and those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, you may be familiar with. There is also some additional context to the term scientific there that was added by creationists and intelligent design proponents in order to describe scientists who possess a materialist worldview. By propagating that disingenuous context amongst their circles, the goal of these individuals was to portray scientists in general as deliberately possessing a bias against the faith. And they back this up by claiming, in accordance with their scripture, that these individuals are simply denying the claim that humans are made in the image of God. Of course, back in reality, we know this to not be the case, because scientific methodology does not start with the assumption that a God exists, as no God has yet been demonstrated to exist. And lastly, and probably most importantly, materialism is not an atheist idea, nor is it logically entailed by being an atheist. There are many atheists out there who currently believe in things that would be categorized as supernatural. And for whatever their justification is, a god or gods are simply not included in that category. So tell us, Casey, exactly how do you plan to defend this non-sequitur that you've kicked everything off with, and how exactly do you think the faithful should respond to it? 
Have you ever seen God? No, I haven't. And in reality, you can't legitimately say you have either, because you possess no critical methodology by which you could ascertain the distinction between an actual experience of a God and you just being convinced to interpret specific phenomena that you observe as your God. Felt a soul? Discovered any evidence for spiritual beings or forces? Nope and nope. Chances are the answer is no, which has led many in the modern world to conclude that there is nothing to life but the physical world. Whoa, pull back on your rosaries there, Casey. I know you have a vested interest in defending your position, but it would probably go a lot better for you if you didn't open up with the implication that the vast majority of people that have left the faith are simply committing an argument from ignorance. Obviously, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Thus, the absence of evidence for a thing should not lead to the conclusion that the thing does not exist. But an absence of evidence of the existence of a thing does indicate that believing that thing exists is irrational and therefore unwarranted until such evidence is discovered. That's twice now you've tried to misrepresent non-believers. That's not a good start, but, but keep going. For materialists, as they're called, we are nothing more than a collection of cells, a series of firing neurons giving the illusion of consciousness, but ultimately just bags of flesh. The material world is all there is. Well, Casey, you've got that partly correct. Materialists do hold that we are matter. However, they don't hold that consciousness is an illusion, but that it is an emergent property, much like the observed collective intelligence of an ant colony. And that illusion you've made that materialists only think that human beings are just bags of meat is grotesquely reductive. But hey, if you can't beat your critics' position, I guess you can always red herring them and just hope that your audience never catches it. As science has progressed over the years, this has become more and more popular. And I'd say the growing trend of people accepting evidence-backed conclusions, conclusions, by the way, that apply equally to everyone, as true over emotion-backed conclusions, which only serve to create unnecessary societal division, is a good thing. Emotions can be reduced to chemical imbalances. It's truly weird that you would frame it that way. Emotions are the result of chemical states in the brain in direct response to external and internal stimuli. You referring to them as imbalances is insidiously misleading. It's miracles to natural phenomena. If an individual claims that any particular phenomenon is a miracle and then that claim collapses under the weight of critical examination, that is hardly the fault of science. Perhaps the claimant should have been a bit more discerning before they decided to pick up that term and start swinging it like a cudgel at the heads of other believers. While there are still some things that science can't explain, proponents of this idea say that it's just a matter of time. Since all there is is matter, we'll eventually be able to figure it all out. Given the undeniable historical track record of supernatural explanations being eliminated as our investigative and experimental prowess has increased, I see no issue in holding the position that observed phenomena do have an explanation. I won't lie to you, Casey, but all of this is starting to feel an awful lot like an appeal to consequences fallacy. But what about one's conscience? What about a sense of right and wrong? The conclusions on morality are evidence-backed as well. Morality is subjective to the individual, that individual's personal moral framework being undergirded by their biological capacity for empathy, and shaped by the external influences of their parents, their peers, and the society in which they live as they develop over time. And if your god were to actually exist, Casey, then morality would necessarily be subjective, as any logically possible moral framework that it could impose upon any logically possible system it could create would necessarily be mind-dependent. And just to heads up, Casey, that you personally don't like the idea of moral relativism is irrelevant. And if that is in fact your rebuttal, then it's just an appeal to consequences fallacy. If you take this idea to its logical conclusion, there is no free will because everything is already determined by our brain chemistry, which means that no choice is any better than any other because choice itself is an illusion. While I will concede that the arguments between free will and determinism is not something that has been definitively answered, and it might very well be something that we could never answer, asserting that scientific materialism logically entails determinism is a non sequitur. And what's really weird is that you committed that fallacy almost immediately after conceding the fact that scientists collectively agree that we do not possess all of the answers. I have to ask you, Casey, is there some fallacy per minute record you're trying to break here? Hitler wasn't bad, it was just his brain chemistry. Interesting. That was quicker than the others. I swear, you all just can't help yourselves, can you? I've said it before, and I will say it again here. Just because something is mind-dependent or subjective does not mean it doesn't exist. Yes, it is collectively agreed upon by the majority of people in society that what Hitler and the Third Reich did was bad. Yes, while there is direct evidence that their collective actions had demonstrable widespread negative effects on the world, that collective agreement is also subjective. But that does not logically entail that morality or some aspect of 
of free will does not exist. That moral relativism entails that things like finding common moral ground between all humans and the appropriate application of justice in any possible scenario are difficult endeavors is just another appeal to consequences. You're not responsible for anything you do, you're just a collection of complex cells. And that is a lie. Moral relativism does not let you off the hook for anything. You're still responsible to your personal group, to the society you choose to be a part of, and most importantly, to yourself. This is absurd. Yeah, and it should be a huge red flag as what you are doing here, reducing people and their experiences and their very identities to nothing, simply because they've rejected your God claims on the grounds that they're irrational, is one of those self-defeating behaviors that you alluded to but then glossed over back at the beginning. For people of faith, we must stress the individuality of the human person. Our thoughts, hopes, dreams, attractions, choices, everything that points to our uniqueness and our freedom to make decisions. You do realize that faith is not the only thing that validates these aspects of the human experience, right? Scientific fields do not reduce or eliminate any of them. They simply recognize them for what they are, identify the evidence that is behind them, and they don't add unjustified baggage like magical thinking to them. This is really just wholly dishonest of you, Casey. And though I've been out of the church for quite some time now, if memory serves, your faith has something to say about that. But hey, given how much intellectual dishonesty I've seen on display so far, maybe these days it's more of a conditional than a universal. When we do this, we show that we are more than just material, that there is something about us that can't be measured or predicted. Again, this is just an appeal to consequences fallacy. I'm sorry that you don't like the fact that evidence-backed conclusions take all the wind out of your appeals to magic and mystery sales. But doing so is a good thing because it helps to reduce the probability that the people's collective ignorance will continue to be taken advantage of for the power and profit of others. We have a conscience. We have a soul. If by conscience you mean an individual's moral intuitions as informed by their capacity for empathy and external influences, then yes. Souls, on the other hand, are a completely different story. So you either need to provide evidence for the existence of souls, or stop conflating that concept with the concept of consciousness because they are not equivalent and all you're doing is opening the door to magical thinking. We have something that animates us beyond the physical world, drawing our attention to a reality beyond the physical world. Some extraordinary evidence for that extraordinary claim beyond your personal fifis would be amazing. Even though we can't prove it, we know that there is something spiritual about our existence. Incorrect. You don't actually know it because it's not a knowledge claim, it's a belief claim. And you believe it because you've been convinced that it's true despite the fact that you cannot know it to be true. Thus, your belief, and by extension, your assertion, are irrational. And that is precisely why faith fails and should be rejected as an epistemological tool. Number two. Rationalism. So this one is a bit easier than the previous one. Rationalism is the philosophical theory that reason, as opposed to experience, is the foundation of certainty and knowledge. In short, the rationalist holds that conclusions and actions should be based on reason and the knowledge it elicits, as opposed to the emotions that one experiences. I also have to point out that rationalism is not logically entailed by atheism, so the fact that Casey is implying that is a non sequitur, the fact that he's bringing it up at all is red herring, and the fact that he doesn't like it is just an appeal to consequences. If materialism is a world defined by science alone, rationalism is a world defined by math and logic alone. While the languages of logic and mathematics are tools that are at work within reason and knowledge, the way you phrase that again is disingenuous. Because all you're really doing here, Casey, is deliberately using reductive phrasing in order to elicit an emotional response from fellow believers. What you're failing to realize here is that by doing this, you are giving the less discerning believer an excuse to reject rationalism that is itself irrational. You can see that there are self-defeating behaviors that push people away from the faith, yet you continue to engage them as if they don't really matter matter in the face of doing everything you can to try and stick it to the atheists. That, or you are legitimately so far gone that you don't actually realize what you're doing. I honestly can't tell which one is the worst position. Because the senses, emotions, and conventions can all be flawed, they cannot be trusted. That's not entirely accurate. While we fully understand that the senses can be flawed, we swiftly acknowledge that they are reliable to a degree. Because we can confirm that reliability through experimentation, independent review, analysis, and predictive modeling. As well as the fact that our senses are reliable enough to have aided in our species' continued survival over the past some 200,000 years. Just because rationalism recognizes the limitations of the physical senses does not mean that it rejects them entirely. There is no truth that can surpass pure human reason. And that was just a phenomenally 
weird statement. Because it isn't human reasoning alone that gets us to what is most likely to be true. Our reasoning is assisted by the various logical languages and methodologies that we've developed to compensate for and improve upon where our physical senses are limited. As with materialism, there is some truth to this. Who's going to argue against science? Who's going to argue against rationality? Who's going to argue against the conclusions that science comes up with? Oh, I don't know. Maybe, you know, scientists will. Because it is literally what their jobs are. To constantly question and poke at the explanations that we have currently confirmed in order to determine if a more accurate explanation exists. Maybe it's just me, Casey, but it may be time to trade that old flower sack in for a lab coat and pocket protector. We don't want to be erratic beings guided solely by emotions or intuitions. True. As a species, we face far too many existential threats for that to be the standard by which we behave. What do the numbers say? What is logical? These are not bad questions to ask. And yet, we all know that what draws us to a beautiful sunset is not that it is rational. We fall in love and get married not because we've made calculations and can logically prove through some theorem that love is real. No. Life's greatest pleasures, what brings us the most meaning, come not from pure logic, but from beauty and love. Seriously, Casey, you do not have enough feet to justify all of this shooting. Again, this is just a big fat red herring with a succulent appeal to consequence on the side. Rationalism itself does not entail that these subjective concepts you're throwing around suddenly cease to exist or that they suddenly don't have any utility value to the individual. Understanding precisely how the sun works, how light filters through the atmosphere at differing angles, and what specific wavelengths my eyes are receiving, in no way diminishes my ability to appreciate the visual aesthetic of a sun setting over the mountains. Rationalism is only pointing out that my appreciation of that visual appeal is irrelevant in regards to any factual claims I make about the phenomenon. The vast majority of individuals in a population may find a thing to be beautiful, but that appeal to popularity does not lead to any objective conclusions about the thing itself. Ultimately, it's about recognizing the distinction between those conclusions that are dependent upon and those conclusions that are independent from the mind of the observer. From art, history, music, poetry, literature, and yes, faith. Unfortunately, Casey, you left out the fact that unlike faith, all of those other things that you rattled off actually reference things that can be demonstrated to exist in reality. And so, the way that we combat the rationalist is not with reasoned arguments or debate. Yeah, it's the primary reason why your arguments don't hold up to basic scrutiny. It's not to play their game with their rules. There's that self-defeating behavior again. If you can't represent those that demonstrate how your arguments fail appropriately with intellectual honesty, best not to try and represent them at all. We must break them out of their isolated worldview to encounter sacred spaces. Wow, poison the well much? Is it really that hard for you to acknowledge why these positions are more valid than yours? Or are you really just that beholden to begging the question? Places that provoke a sense of awe and wonder, that point to something beyond anything that can be explained. I surmise your capacity to reason has been compromised by your cultural indoctrination. This is to be expected. Please depart. While I fully understand that your emotional states are vitally important to you, and I know how badly you need the supernatural to exist in order to derive some sense of meaning for yourself, unfortunately such things are irrelevant when it comes to determining truth. As Blaise Pascal once said, the heart has its reasons which reason knows nothing of. We know the truth not only by reason, but by the heart. Yeah, appealing to a 17th century mathematician who himself was also a lifelong Catholic and thus predicated all of his philosophical conclusions and his erroneous wager on that prior held belief is not going to work out as well for you as you hope it will. Feeling strongly that something is true does not indicate that it is in fact true. While it's true that our emotions and intuition can't always be trusted, there is no reason to throw it away completely which no one is doing. We just recognize that emotions, while valid, have their own place and that's where they should stay. Remember the feeling of seeing your first child. Let yourself be overwhelmed with falling in love. Look at the stars with immense wonder and don't try to analyze why. <laughs> don't ask, I said don't ask, I said don't ask. No questions, just give the money. Again, no one is saying that you can't do this and that there is no value in doing so. We've just recognized that there is a time and a place for such things, and that time and place is not when we are deriving conclusions about what is true about reality. There's something that speaks to us beyond pure rationality, and it is the truth. No, that's not pointing to truth. That's pointing to what you want to be true. Stop conflating the two. Number three, 
secularism. This should be an interesting one. Secularism is actually pretty simple, as it's the principle of the separation between church and state. But it also can refer to the freedom of and freedom from religion in a society, and to the political ideology of conducting human affairs based on naturalistic considerations, meaning those considerations that are backed by evidence and thus apply equally to everyone, as opposed to religious considerations that are emotions backed and societally divisive. Secularism is also not an atheistic idea, nor is it in hailed by being an atheist. But given the evidence that indicates that secularism is the position that provides the best opportunities for societal equality and cohesion, what exactly is your gripe with it, Casey? No doubt you've heard the word secular used by religious people a lot, complaining about the secular world, secular music, secular culture. While often used to denote anything hostile towards religion, what we see in this trend, and what is so dangerous, is something that is solely of this world, pointing to this current age alone. That's a bit uncharitable. You know, you can stop begging the question at any time. I mean, I don't know if you knew that. And present the evidence you have to back up the assertion that there is something that exists beyond this life that we need to be concerned with. But until that time comes, embracing evidence-backed inclusive social systems is the best option we have for safeguarding our society. An offshoot of materialism, secularism can see nothing beyond the reality in which we live. This world that we live in, this temporality, is all that exists. Again, unnecessarily reductive and irrelevant to the argument. That is until you can present the evidence that such a thing exists beyond the reality in which we live. There is no heaven or hell, no alternate realms, nothing to hope for beyond this life. Right, so the thing you should be rationally focusing your hope on is this life. You know, the one that you're currently living and ostensibly should be present for. And I know there's probably a joke in there about how your overuse of appeal to consequence fallacies is really just an overcompensation for your lack of intimate relations, but it's probably buried underneath your robe somewhere. It is why the secularist is often so invested in politics and is constantly fighting off despair. Wow, that ain't no fallacy. That's just a straight up bald faced lie. Ballsy. Stupid, but ballsy. Being a secularist does not entail a persistent state of despair, and an individual dedicating their focus to politics or other things that pertain to our lives in the here and now also does not entail a persistent state of despair. It's just evidence that because these individuals understand that this one life is all we get, then it behooves them to be involved in that life and accomplish as much as they can with it while they're still here. In other words, Casey, these individuals do not need the promise of a heaven or the threat of a hell to get up off their ass and do some good in the world. Something I might add that harkens back to those less than desired Christian behaviors that you referenced back at the start. If this is the only world, we must do everything to make this world perfect, everything to save ourselves. Yeah, sounds pretty good. Unfortunately, this is a problem that has begun to slip even into Christianity. In certain forms of liberation theology on the left and Christian nationalism on the right, faithful people lose sight of heaven and invest themselves entirely in fixing this world. Probably because more people are realizing that it is far more productive and rewarding to improve something that exists for future generations than to abandon it for something for which there exists no evidence beyond subjective conceptualization. Politics becomes their religion, for what else is there? That something can be very important to a person does not make it a religion. That is a false equivalency, and frankly, it's Bush League. Even you should know better, Casey. Of course, there is so much more than this world. Once again, I ask for any evidence you may have to support that extraordinary claim. What we experience in this life is but a foretaste of the life to come. Nope, that's just begging the question. While God's presence is certainly found in this world, and we must do what we can to be good stewards of his gifts, there is something that will inevitably unsettle us about the world. Something that should make us feel like it is not our true home. That may be your sad experience, but it is not the experience of everyone. I know this because I myself am not unsettled by anything about this finite planet or this finite life. Well, except maybe the sheer amount of flat earthers. That level of reality denial is fairly unsettling. It's insane, right? that you've been convinced to hold a level of dissatisfaction with this world or your own life is your problem and your problem alone. Stop projecting your indoctrinated negativity onto everyone else. No matter how hard we work, it will never be what we truly desire. Yeah, not with that attitude. This right here is where we must lead people. We must draw out people's dissatisfaction with the world, their deep desire for something more.
which of course is just you making the assumption that people are naturally dissatisfied with the world and that the something more they may be looking for cannot come from the life they're living. And that's one of those terrifying things that I cannot stand religion for. And that is the constant diminishing of this life in this world. This weird desperate need to convince other people that this life and this world are somehow not worth truly living every moment for. It's a tactic designed to control the emotions and thoughts of other people and thus control their behaviors. It's one of the many reasons why Christianity is a cult, and it's one of those many behaviors we talked about before that you and people like you constantly engage in that thankfully people are getting wise to. Remind them of the futility of their work, that we will eventually die, and that this world will fade away with no memory of us. Is he serious? Okay, so let me get this straight, Casey. Your big solution to combating secularism, despite the fact that it is not logically entailed by atheism, is for believers to actively gaslight secularists into believing the non-sequitur that they are logically entailed to be nihilists, just so that you can come along and then emotionally manipulate those people into believing that only true value and meaning can come from your asserted faith position. While I am certain I am not the first person to ask you this, but what the f*** is wrong with you? Deep down, we know that this is wrong. Deep down, there is a longing in each one of us for eternity. Uh, no there isn't. That's your bullshit. Casey. For some people, myself included, the very idea of an eternal existence is quite literally a version of hell. Just because you believe it for yourself doesn't make it true for everyone else. So again, stop projecting. Number four. Relativism. Given that relativism is the philosophical view that denies objective claims within particular domains, and that subsequent valuations are necessarily subjective or mind-dependent, it should be pointed out that not only is relativism not logically entailed by being an atheist, but Casey has actually been making arguments against relativism in all three of his previous points. Now likely, this is just going to descend into another appeal to consequences fallacy, or he may even take it to the extreme and draw a false equivalence between relativism and some Something like moral nihilism. You do you. Whatever makes you happy. Well, that's just my truth. Mantras of a generation. Mantras of a world defined by relativism. I swear, I could have used his prior responses to develop a predictive model on par with orbital mechanics truth that is purely subjective. So this is yet another false equivalency. While relativism does hold that things like knowledge, truth, and morality are subjective to a degree and are not absolutes, this is really only an entailment of the fact that human beings are currently confined to their internal subjective experiences. Even if we humans did in fact have access to something that we would define as objective reality or absolute truth, there does not currently exist a methodology by which we could divorce ourselves of our subjective experience to determine that it was in fact objective reality or absolute truth that we had access to. This does also entail that truth claims are probabilistic in nature, and they can be probabilistic to the degree that it would be irrational to doubt them, but that does not mean that truth claims can just be whatever the hell people want them to be. Relativism does not entail that objective truth claims, or those claims that correspond with mind-independent reality are absolutely subjective, nor is relativism equivalent to epistemological nihilism or fallibilism. The idea is that knowledge itself does not exist or is absolutely unattainable, or that all knowledge is uncertain, respectively. The opposite of rationalism... No, the opposite of rationalism is empiricism, and the opposite of relativism is absolutism. Less time in Vespers, more time in philosophy class. Relativism posits that all truth is defined not by facts or logic, but by the feelings and experiences of each individual. While I would argue that the definition can vary depending on the context, there really is no problem here because at its base, relativists aren't making claims beyond the scope of what we appear to have direct access to, which is something that the theistic worldview is predicated upon. Ultimately, this is just another appeal to consequence. Something may be true for one person, but not for another. When it comes to describing things like beauty, justice, and morality, yes. But not when it comes to describing mind-independent objects. For years, Pope Benedict XVI warned against the dangers of relativism, but even he could not have predicted how quickly it would pull at the very fabric of our society. Well, given that he was the Pope, it stands to reason that he would take a strong stance against any kind of a position that posed a potential threat to Catholicism's position of cultural power. In so much of our world today, facts have no worth. Logic is irrelevant. 
there appears to be nothing that we can agree on and no way to come to consensus. I have to point out that the image that you posted up there of that 2017 article by Francis Fukuyama was an opinion piece regarding a growing generational view of information, and it had absolutely nothing to do with relativism. The term post-fact that Fukuyama used there was in reference to the concept that we currently live in a world where the advent of readily available information and disinformation, and the growing cultural resistance to what is perceived as gatekeeping, has led to a social trend in which virtually all authoritative sources can be called into question and challenged on even the most dubious of grounds. And the second article you referenced up there, the 2017 article by Ozan Barrel, that one was also an opinion piece, but that one was regarding the psychological phenomenon of hitting a person with a deluge of facts can often have the opposite effect of convincing them of something and actually lead them to further entrench themselves in their position. That's why that article mentions how important empathy is to the persuasion process. That article also had nothing to do with relativism, and neither did the last two article headlines you put up there. Because the top one was a 2011 NPR discussion in regards to the problems with hardcore partisanship and the apparent unwillingness of parties to compromise for fear that it will make them look weak to their constituents, while the second headline is from a now-since-deleted 2021 article that appeared on Salon.com in which the author McLennan was addressing the exact same issues created by extreme partisanship. And I gotta tell you, Casey, if you can't even be bothered to read the articles that you're referencing, and you're just relying on believers reading that headline and then connecting the dots in accordance with their own personal biases, then all you've really done here is given us another fine example of those detrimental behaviors that believers tend to engage in. And by the way, the preponderance of evidence that supports a particular conclusion is what allows us to come to a consensus. This is what happens when you address a particular philosophical position as though people hold them in a vacuum, and you ignore the fact that these philosophical positions inform and are informed by the other philosophical positions that a person can hold. But surely, no one can actually believe in relativism. Like I said, relativism in a vacuum, unlikely. But relativism by virtue of its contextual application, or relativism tempered by other positions like, for example, methodological naturalism, yes. Honestly, that's one of the small issues I have with the fluid nature of philosophy in general. Just because you may subscribe to one thing does not mean you are that one thing in all cases absolutely, nor does it mean that you are only that one thing or that you will always be that one thing. There is a world with definitive forces and laws, with measurable experiences and matter, things that are one thing and not another. Ignorance may lead us to different conclusions, but there are right and wrong answers, things that are the way they are regardless of perspective. Wow, you misrepresented relativism so that you could generate a problematic entailment to argue against, and then you supported that argument with a reference to an area where relativism doesn't actually apply, and you have the audacity to wonder why people don't trust the faith anymore. And if this is true, if there is only one thing that is objective, how did it come to be that way? Well, that's an excellent question. And when you have the sufficient evidence to support a particular answer for it, I'm quite certain there will be some major science or philosophy prizes in your future. But until then, just asserting that the answer is your God because you happen to have defined your God as that which answers the question is just a God of the gaps. Why is there something rather than nothing? Because nothing as a state cannot exist. Given the incoherency of the concept of nothing, this should have been fairly obvious. But just because there was always something does not mean that that something was yours or any other version of God. And why is it intelligible at all? Well, for something to be intelligible or understandable requires the existence of a mind to do the comprehending. This universe that we occupy is intelligible to humans because we ourselves are products of the universe. To a degree, evolution truth tracks, positively selecting for those percentages of a population of organisms that can navigate their environments coherently. And we can observe the direct evidence that when those organisms are fundamentally unable to comprehend their environments coherently, then they tend to die off pretty quickly. This is why we don't need to reference some external agent that is defined as imposing intelligibility upon the universe for which there exists no evidence, and we only need to reference the existence of something that exists, like us humans. The person of faith, quite obviously, will point to God. And they often do that because they are not familiar with why that is the demonstrably incorrect conclusion to come to. But objective being itself. Which, of course, is just defining it into existence and committing a God of the gaps fallacy. There is something that created all that is and knows all that is. That's another massive claim that's going to require some massive evidence to support. But given that your video is intended for your fellow believers, I understand why you haven't presented it yet. This is why echo chambers are ultimately self-defeating. We may have our own individual perspectives and experiences of the created reality, 
but there is but one objective created reality because there is but one objective creator being. And that which can be asserted without evidence can be rejected without evidence. And finally, number five, nihilism. Given the track you've been on so far, Casey, it was a 50-50 shot you'd either end up here or at solipsism. So I will say that I'm glad to see that you're well-read enough to understand why solipsism doesn't hold up. Now as for nihilism, which is a fairly complex family of philosophical views, in its simplest form, it's a position of extreme skepticism that maintains that nothing in the world has a real existence. It is also commonly used to refer to the rejection of all religious and moral principles and the belief that life is inherently meaningless. And just like every other point you've brought up here, Casey, it is not logically entailed by atheism. If there is one thing spreading through Gen Z like wildfire, it's this. Hopelessness, apathy, distrust. We're worse off than the generation before us, and it's only gonna get worse. First off, in the words of one of my favorite content creators, citation needed. Yes, it is true that Gen Z is facing a number of pressing social issues that are made all the more apparent by the advent of social media. But it has also been shown that these issues are not without reason. It's important to remember that just like the rise of people who identified as LGBTQ was as a result of broader awareness and societal acceptance, what you are interpreting as an increase in these pervasive social issues is actually just our culture being more aware of their existence and being more readily willing to talk about them. Oh, and I also took the time to check out those various headlines that you threw up all over the screen. This one was an opinion piece that appeared over on Medium that explored the correlation between generational issues and the rise of social media and the reported loneliness rates among adults. This one was a Wall Street Journal opinion piece that explored the current generation's growing awareness of and dissatisfaction with the systemic failures of America's institutions due to an extreme lack of government accountability. And this last one was a finance article over on CNBC that explored the insane generational wealth wealth gap and its residual effects on the cost of living that is inordinately affecting the current generation, resulting in a growing distrust and anger with American administration and authority. The interesting thing, Casey, is that while all of those articles do address some connection between Gen Z and an observed increase in reported social and personal concerns, all of them are opinion pieces and none of them cite any kind of a study that supports your claim that Gen Z are becoming more nihilistic. However, despite the dishonesty that you've presented here, it was pretty brilliant of you to give such a fine demonstration of how religion invents the problem and then attempts to sell you the cure. There's nothing we can do. The nihilist gives in to the idea that there is no point to anything and that resistance is futile. Why try? It's always impressive to me to see just how many fallacies a person can commit all at once. Nihilism, whichever form it takes or context that it is applied within, does not logically entail hopelessness or futility. And that some members of Gen Z may tend towards nihilism or some may even wind up nihilist does not mean that they all are. So this was both a non sequitur and a fallacy of composition. Now from here, I'm gonna go ahead and skip this next section because all it is is Casey citing all of the major negative things that have happened in society since 9-11. Then he makes the really weird claim that things like Vine and TikTok are just coping mechanisms for Gen Z to deal with their existential dread and hopelessness. And I also have no doubt that you're getting as sick of his gaslighting as I am. But cope, they have not. Because we all know that social media can be as much an echo chamber as anything else, perpetuating what we want to hear and shielding us from alternative narratives. An ordained Franciscan friar and Catholic priest who advocates for believers to gaslight non-believers instead of listening to their valid positions, then railing against social media for the apparent echo chambers it creates is a level of irony I did not expect, but I am also not surprised by. Like the fact that we are technically in the most peaceful time in human history. Children have never been safer from disease. Poverty is at an all-time low, literacy an all-time high. In so many ways, the world is filled with goodness and progress. And all that at a time when religious affiliation is dropping precipitously across the country. I'm not saying correlation implies causation, but that may be less coincidental than you're willing to admit, Casey. As Christians, it can be easy to look at this world with frustration, but we can never give in to despair. It's gonna be okay. I completely get that when you start losing cultural ground, it can be very disheartening. But you don't have to worry because there are plenty of secular support groups available to you should you need them. Now from here, we're gonna go ahead and skip this last section because all it is is just Casey selling the validation that his followers so desperately need. And in the process of doing so, he just doubles down on all of his previous claims, provides no evidence for any of them, and then makes another tiny little reference to all those issues that exist within the church. Issues that I will concede he made excellent demonstrations of 
of in his video. To be perfectly honest with you, Casey, Holy Grail style evangelism would have been more effective than what you just did here. Now, when it comes to bridging the divide here, while I feel we may be at an impasse with Casey, I do not think we are at one with his followers. So the best that I can offer them is that if you desire to know the philosophical positions that an individual holds to, then do them and yourself a favor and just ask them. Take the time to parse out what the other person's positions are. Do the actual legwork so that if you are going to debate them on a particular topic, you can represent them correctly. In other words, do not do what Casey did here, because that kind of behavior will only kill any kind of a conversation right in the crib, and the last possible thing we need right now, regardless if you're an atheist or a theist, is even more completely unnecessary and totally avoidable societal divisions. Thank you all so much for watching, I do hope you enjoyed the video. A massive thank you to The Skeptic for the opportunity to help out over here on your channel. Of all the Schwarzschild radii in the universe one could find themselves caught in, this one has by far the best information and none of the spaghettification. And a massive thank you to each and every single one of you out there for your continued support of both of our channels. If you enjoy this kind of content, check out all of the provided links down in the description, and as always, be safe, be excellent to each other, and together we can bridge the divide. Back to you, skeptic. And there we have it, Casey just assuming he knows what's up with what atheists believe, but getting it completely wrong. And JL was there to give him what for. Nice one, JL. You can find the Bridge the Divide link in the description. Go and say hi and drop him a sub as a thank you for this epic video. What a legend for stepping in and taking on the handsome, well-spoken, slightly smug friar. I'm going to skeptic this as one idea that may never catch on. Sorry, Casey. A big thank you to this month's top level ticks on Patreon. Dark Ether Piao. Tamo, the barely bearable atheist. George, Godless Granny. Addy Rockart, The Enixes, Jakari, Elizabeth, Whiskey Tech Fred and Rick as well as all the $3 base ticks. You can become a supporter on Patreon too at patreon.com slash the skeptic. The link is in the description along with links to all my other socials. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. From me, the skeptic, stay safe, keep thinking logically and ask questions. Skepticism is the first step towards truth. See you next Saturday.